My guests today are Henning Rauch and Vincent Philippe Lausanne. Gentlemen, how are you? I'm doing fine. Uh, hey, David. Uh, thanks for thanks for thanks for having us. And uh, yeah, I'm doing exceptionally well. What about you, VP? I'm doing well. Thank you, Henning. And uh, good day, uh, David. It's Friday, so always good. Friday is good. I know, Henning, you're in Germany. It's almost the end of the day on Friday, almost the end of the week, and. Uh, Vincent Philippe, you're in Montreal, is that right? That's correct. Okay, and I'm in Chicago. <laughs> but you all work, you work together. You work on the uh, Azure Data Explorer team, correct? Yeah, yeah. we're both uh, product manager on the uh, Azure Data Explorer team. Henning has been there for longer, for two or three years, Henning? Yeah, I started in uh, 2019. I joined the team, yeah. 2019, and then now, yeah, well, almost like three years in team. It's like uh, just phenomenal and journey so far. That's interesting. It's 2019, but I only recently heard about this product. It's uh, It's been around a lot longer than it's been visible to the public, right? Absolutely. So it was created by Microsoft probably 10 years ago as a small startup in Israel. And we still have our quote unquote founders with us. So it was essentially a team of, uh, of four people that had the task to do something with all of this uh, Power BI uh, log and telemetry data. And there was no pass service available which could handle all of that load, so they created it. And uh, this is was this was the time when the product, quote unquote, Custo uh, was born. And in 2019, uh, this was in, I think in, in February 2019, we opened it up as a third party service to our external um, customer. Uh, tell me a little about uh, Azure Data Explorer or ADX. What exactly does it do? What problem does it solve? Do you want to know? Yeah, yeah, I can. Uh, I can have a shot at it. So, uh, uh, Azure Data Explorer is an analytical database. So, it is really a database where you ingest data and to analyze your data. So, it's not a transactional data a database. It's really made for analyzing time series. It's really great uh, with anything that has a timestamp on it. It doesn't need a timestamp, but it's, uh, it, it performs especially uh, well with uh, time series data. And as Henning mentioned, it was built to handle logs, uh, but then it grew to IoT and to all different types of telemetry and uh, data and logs. That's what it performs best at. Why, why did we need a data, an extra database to handle time series data? Why not use, I don't know, Cosmos or one of the many relational databases that already existed? <laughs> Hey, David, you, you start with the funniest uh, topics uh, right away. So Cosmos DB is a wonderful database. Uh, it's an excellent database, but it's, uh, uh, and it's, and it's, it's doing a great job for things like, like web apps and relational databases are awesome for uh, querying fast and um, querying data really, really fast. But the, the, the schema needs to be structured 100%. Like uh, Custo is, um, is, first of all, it, it um, it's uh, it's made for append-only data, and this is also why it allows us to throw away some of the concepts that are not needed for append-only data. So VP was already mentioning already mentioned that uh, we're not a transactional database, so we don't support things like uh, transactions, asset asset transactions. And on the other hand, this allows us to get more and, and to ingest the data with with a higher performance, with a higher bandwidth, and with uh, other databases. And it also allows us to do like efficient time series um, analytics uh, using using KQL. And um, I would say like um, it's the only database at Microsoft that really grew organically in the organization. This is what I'm hearing from time to time uh, talking with with internal partners. Um, and meanwhile, uh, probably 99.9% of all log and telemetry data which is produced at Microsoft and is stored in this in this database. And we're not only talking about Azure, so the stuff that you see sometimes uh, with your billing records or with your resources when you're using Azure Resource Graph uh, or Application Insights. It's also data from uh, LinkedIn, Skype, Bing, Office, uh, Power BI, 
Uh, yeah, a lot of them, even all yeah. the, even the, the gaming industry. Yeah. Usually, uh, the, one of the tagline we have is uh, a billion rec uh, queries over a billion records under one second. And this is where usually, if you try with other databases, at some point in the scale, it will break. That's what a lot of customers, uh, when they start their journey with ADX, is usually they try something else, and then their business grew, and at some point, the scalability either broke or it didn't. It became uh, not viable business-wise. Like it became too expensive to uh, to go to bigger and bigger SQ. And ADX scales very well to those uh, billions of records, petabytes of data per table. So, so the big difference between this and other databases is its scalability and its uh, faster response time. Um, and right. like, uh, if, if you're not if you're not enforcing updates, you're not enforcing referential integrity. Those inserts can be a lot faster, but even the queries can be faster at a huge scale. Yeah. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So when the like going from being and just using just used internally at some point the product groups found out hey why don't we build services on top of that and this is where the success of azure monitor started with lock analytics also all of the security products uh, with threat detection sentinel iot products like iot central and also dynamics is, uh, is using it so we've been used uh, internally quite a lot to store all of the lock and telemetry data and then Customers build service on top of that. Yeah, that gives me a little comfort. Uh, even though the product, as a product, is only since 2019, yes, uh, it's been hammered on by the internal teams at Microsoft for years before that. So a lot of the the, the bugs yeah. have been left out. A lot of the optimization has been done before the customer ever saw it. Absolutely, it's definitely like uh, it's bulletproof. I can definitely say it's bulletproof. Uh, just to come up with some numbers. Uh, Every day, like uh, we are, we're ingesting up to a hundred um, or 108 petabyte into wow. into that uh, service. Yeah, and what, what's the total now? They have all the clusters in the world in exabytes, but uh, what's the eight, what's the latest eight, number? Eight, eight, eight exabytes. exabytes, more than eight exabytes, just crazy. In the relational database, it's think a thousand about petabytes, <laughs> which is a thousand gigabytes or terabytes, which is a thousand gigabytes. Got it? Okay. So it's ten to the fifteenth, maybe. It's a um, lot. Yeah. So tell me about uh, the as a, a database person and as a developer. How do we get started with ADX? VP, that's for you. Yeah, the uh, developers. How do you get started? I would say start with a tutorial. We have good tutorial on the uh, online doc. You can even uh, play with it because the tutorial will link you to a free, uh, free uh, like a cluster that's available for everyone. Uh, I would say the second step would be to get a free cluster. We offer like a free cluster that you just need an email address. You don't even need a Azure subscription or credit card, and you can uh, start uh, ingesting some data and uh, bagging some queries. And usually okay. that's the uh, that's the secret I always say for people: just load data and start using it. You'll find insights in your data very quickly, and you'll get hooked. <laughs> that's the, How do we ingest data into ADX? So there are multiple ways to do that. Actually, we integrate with uh, lots of ecosystems. Uh, the, probably the simplest ways is to take uh, blobs, so uh, files basically, either Parquet, CSVs, uh, Avro. We support a bunch of formats, so you can point to a storage account and ingest the data. Uh, otherwise, we integrate with streaming, with uh, Event Hub, IoT Hub, Kafka. Uh, we have a Spark connector, so if you have a Spark workload and you want to push data, we have a lock stash connector if you want to, you come from the Elk uh, stack. So we have different connectors if you want to push data into uh, into Custom. So hmm. many ways to do it. And uh, to, to add on top of that, uh, over the, so those are just the connectors that we built or that we like helped others to build. But also meanwhile, other other offerings, other SaaS offerings in Microsoft, they offer is quote unquote historization uh, features. So examples here are um, IoT Central. So whenever you like work with your IoT data and devices, it's very very easy to onboard them to IoT Central. And uh, recently, they they created a new feature to export data to Custo for long term storage and analytics. Same thing with Azure Digital Twins. And recently, I think we also G8 or the Azure Stream Analytics team uh, G8 the connector. Which, di which is directly ingesting into, into ADX. So what, what you learn from that is that actually Kusu is very well embedded into the Azure ecosystem. 
uh, of services like like we he mentioned, but we also integrate well with open source uh, systems such as uh, Docstash or Telegraph or or others. So it's actually very easy to ingest, and we have uh, even like a dedicated feature for that. Like BP was mentioning blobs, so you don't need to go to some place and and uh, type in KQL to ingest data. With a feature that is called uh, one click ingestion, it actually might be three clicks, but okay. <laughs> 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 it's still not bad, you know. Um, so it's it's inferring the schema from those files. So if you have a CSV. Or, or parquet, whatever kind of format that we can digest, it automatically creates a schema for you. It creates the mapping for you, so it, need, it needs to know at some point which column, which data field needs to go into which column in Custo. And then it's also triggering the ingestion, and you can also uh, configure it in a way that it's doing continuous ingestion, like uh, continuous ingestion from event up or from uh, storage using event grid. So oh, it's very, very simple. And as uh, VP mentioned, um, we are investing heavily uh, as, a, as a product team in getting KQL, our language, and the service to the masses. So what we recently uh, published is uh, it's a service that allows you to use our technology for free. For free means no credit card, no subscription. The only thing that you need is uh, some sort of a Microsoft identity. So you can use your the identity that you use on Azure or your Outlook uh, identity. Uh, I think Gmail should, al should also work. And then you can just create your own cluster. You can use it for all of like uh, your 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 things that, that you like to use uh, for training. We see a lot of like training going on. For example, I myself I'm doing most of my home automation with those uh, with those free clusters. And it, uh, really, yes, it's like. It's awesome. I'm doing bathroom analytics. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's like IoT is a big use case for yes. this because IoT tends to just accumulate huge amounts of data. If you're sending telemetry data, you know, every second or multiple times per second, it yeah. just adds up, even if it's a small message. It's a stream of data, so it, it's naturally a time series. Something okay. I didn't mention, I should mention, we're uh, Something I'm very excited about. We, uh, you mentioned Cosmos DB. We're about to integrate with Cosmos DB, so we'll be able oh, to have the best of both worlds. We'll have your transactional database with Cosmos DB that has incredible performance for point queries and transactional uh, and uh, tra transactional workloads. And you'll be able to have your analytical workloads in Custo in near real time. So you'll have a sync between the two. So, uh, that's uh, that's starting in private limited private preview right now, but uh, stay tuned. We're gonna have that. I'm very excited about that. Oh, excellent! Uh, you mentioned KQL a couple of times. What is that? KQL query language. Yes. <laughs> Come on, everybody knows that. Why are you asking that? David? Everybody knows SQL. Is ah, it ah. <laughs> no KQL. That's our that's our query language. It's as the VP said, our Kusto query language is more like a functional uh, query language, and it lets you work with Kusto very, very efficiently. Um, by the way, for, for folks, you mentioned SQL, and we know that SQL is probably the, the language in databases, which is, uh, which is like the, which has the biggest user base, so to speak. Um, and on top of uh, KQL, we still have like for backwards compatibility or for legacy systems. <laughs> we, we have we have an, an, an MSTDS endpoint, so something like a T SQL head on top of uh, on top of Custo. So for every ADX cluster that you create um, on our endpoints, you get on a different port. I think on one, port one four three three. And an endpoint, an MSTDS endpoint, which can be used for uh, making an ODBC or a JDBC connection to the cluster. Then we take the SQL stream, the SQL uh, string, translate it into KQL, um, calculate whatever we need to calculate, and return back the result. Oh, so yeah, essentially, SQL commands to ADX, and it would understand them. That's correct. Yes. Uh, yeah, it appears like a read-only SQL server, basically. Yes. That's interesting. I did notice that in uh, what's the tool, the Data Explorer, I think it's called. If you paste SQL in, it uh, yeah. uh, there's uh, it's it's smart enough to translate it. Indicate. Exactly, you can just run something like an explain and a SQL command, explain. and then it will it will it will translate it to KQL for you. 
I saw that with the customers using that. Um, it's uh, it's great. I found that useful because I'm I, I you know I grew up with SQL and KQL yeah. came to me as I was learning it. It was a great learning tool. Yeah. Um, tell me about the scaling. How does that work? So it works. Uh, is Henning mentioned a few times a cluster. So ADX comes in the form of a cluster, so it means multiple machines. Uh, you don't manage the machines, but uh, they are VMs underneath that uh, Microsoft manages for you. Uh, so those VMs have SKUs, so we, pro we, uh, we propose only SKUs that have been certified with ADX that performs well. So you can either scale up, so you can take a VM that has you know more CPUs, more memory, more uh, local SSDs, because we leverage local SSDs. Or you can scale out, so have uh, multiple nodes on your cluster, up to 1,000 nodes. The biggest cluster has 1,000 nodes. So Is there any dynamic scaling supported with ADX? Yeah, so there's auto scaling uh, that we've been supporting for quite a while. And recently, we moved to predictive auto scaling, uh, which basically look at your workload, look at your history, and tries to find when you have peaks and try to preempt basically the scaling so that uh, when the queries start hitting, you're uh, ready to go which is always a challenge, even in web application, like I remember doing uh, Azure uh, Azure apps, and it's always a challenge. If you wait for the workload to be hot and uh, struggling, then you wait for the time that your cluster is scaling. So we're trying to predict that using machine learning algorithms. So that's the new, uh, that's the new approach. Yeah. Interesting. Um, the, uh, you mentioned earlier that this is really good for data with timestamps, for time series data. W what are some of the advantages of that ADX has over other databases for time series data? So, so first of all, for, for time series data, um, in most of the scenarios, what, what you want to do is you want to define a couple of uh, Uber variables. The first one are Uber configurations. The first one is something like a retention period. For some customers, when they uh, ingest time series data, they want to configure that they want to keep this data only for a certain amount of days. Uh, sometimes it's like a, a regulatory requirement that you're only allowed to store the data for 28 days. And sometimes customers, they must store the data for 10 years, but then after those 10 years, they require that the data is dropped, okay? So that's the one thing that you want to define, the retention period for this time series or log or telemetry data. And then the other thing that you want to define is, uh, given I have a, a, a table with a certain schema, uh, and I know that my users are using that table and most of the queries look back X number of days. So you also want to define that those X number of days, they are quote unquote hot. So VP mentioned beforehand that we leverage local SSDs on virtual machines. And this is where this hot data goes to, okay? So we always store all the data always on Azure storage accounts under the hood, but this hot data lands uh, on a local SSD and it's like super fast. Now, um, what else, what else makes, uh, makes, makes Kusto an exceptionally well database for time series is that we automatically partition the data by time, by ingestion time. And this allows us to do this hot versus cold and also the all of the retention period uh, uh, configuration. And then the query language itself, if you try to do some kind of a group by statement that you know from SQL in Kusto, that would be a summarize then the aggregate by, then by one to the, the group by argument, so to speak. And that it's very, very easy to write those kinds of statements in KQL. So you can bin by timestamps of a day, but also by timestamps of a second, by an arbitrary time span, uh, so to speak. And then for, for time series, we added another thing that it was a game changer for us. So besides all of these uh, pretty simple uh, summarize by timestamp or by bin timestamp, um, constructs. We did a new operator, which was adding like true time series capabilities to Gusto, and this operator is called make series. And here we are actually leaving this row by row uh, based approach and entering a vectorized format, which means for the 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 um, the group by keys that we that we want to use for a time series calculation. The, the resulting rows, they are structured in vectors. So if I want to have the average temperature of a certain sensor in a resolution of 29 seconds, then I get two arrays, one of uh, having those 29 uh, second differences for, for each and every uh, timestamp, and the other one with all of the values. 
and then we can do uh, great things like um, interpolation so we can fill up values missing values this is something something that you always need for in iot scenarios because you always have missing data from right. devices that stop sending and so you need to have some interpolation mechanisms and this also allows us to do simple um simple uh, um, algorithms allowed, which allow you to do forecasting of this time series um, anomaly detection regression analysis without even uh, having the need to deploy uh, an actual machine learning model. And this is actually where this was kind of the flipping point where customers, internal and external customer realized, hey, this database is more than just a storage, a cheap storage for log that lets you analyze it. It also really, it, it really allows you to, to implement um, use cases for IoT data and, and other scenarios, yeah. Wow. Um. ADX sounds amazing. It, is there any, are there any scenarios where it is not appropriate, where you want to store data that ADX is not the answer? Uh, probably uh, multimedia, like videos, audio chains, that's not, uh, we're not a, like a general storage. We're, uh, we are a relational database, although we do handle uh, semi-structure, so JSON format or XML, uh, Full text, uh, full text uh, support as well. But in terms of like general stream, like audio, video, we're not good at that. Okay. Otherwise, as Henning mentioned, we're not a transactional database. So uh, as a backend for transaction, it would be a very poor one because we don't offer any asset guarantees. Uh, what scenarios do we not do? Uh, ETL and uh, machine learning in terms of training models. Uh, we're not, uh, we don't target those scenarios. We target scoring. So if you train a model somewhere else, you can import the model in, uh, in ADX right. and have it scored in real time. Uh, but we don't train models. We don't even offer uh, SKUs with, uh, VM SKUs with GPUs. So that's not something we do currently. And same thing ETL, like big long, the long transformation. We don't, we don't get really good at that. Exactly. So there's, 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 there's just like one big uh, thing which is very important, which differentiates uh, things that you can do with Custo and things that you can't do with Custo. And uh, that one para parameter is uh, like what we define as interactive analytics, because right now Custo is an interactive analytical database, okay? And interactivity for us ends after one hour. <laughs> you know, it's just somebody was uh, gambling, so when does interactive analytics end? And we said one hour. Well, what does so that mean? Every, it ends yeah, so every, every query that you try to execute against our database is uh, is there's a hard stop for it uh, after one hour. Okay, so as VP mentioned, if you want to do trainings or uh, machine learning on like let's say like five petabytes of data, it might take longer than one hour. Okay, depending on how many nodes you have. Um, so this is not a good use case for us, even if you're also working on uh, on uh, providing like really long running uh, KQL statements. But at the moment, this is a limitation that you need to be aware of. And I think VP made uh, uh, explained it very well. Yeah. I think most databases have some sort of limit on the query before they time out. Uh, usually it's configurable. Yep. Cost is configurable as well, but the the absolute uh, upper 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 limit is one hour. So beyond that, there's nothing that you can configure. Got um, it. Is there anything else on the roadmap? You mentioned the Cosmos DB integration. Uh, what what can we expect in the future besides that? Uh, so, very soon, next week, we'll have a Custo emulator. So we'll have a container Docker container version of Custo. Yeah, which uh, will run locally. Yeah. Yeah, you can run locally. So the two big scenarios we are targeting with that is uh, local development. So if you want to have your own you know, environment and mm -hmm. the other one is CI CD automated uh, testing. So you can you know, provision the, the, uh, the container and run your test locally very, very fast. Well, lo locally to the CI CD agent that is. Uh, otherwise, what do we have on the roadmap, Henning? Always, uh, oh, it's, uh, some, uh, some yeah, great stuff. So, so, so first of all, not, not, not even talking about the roadmap. Uh, we need to clarify what happened like one or two weeks ago. One mm -hmm. or two weeks ago, we created a, an SKU for Custo. Think about mm -hmm. that. Like Microsoft created an SKU, a virtual machine type for Custo. This is how important this product is to uh, to us. And this this new SKU is called LV3. Um, 
And uh, what it definitely, it, it's good for like a storage, opti storage optimized workloads, which means uh, if you want to keep a lot of data in cache, what you want to have is a, a strong CPU and a strong I.O. Uh, throughput to, uh, to, uh, to network and to a local NVMe disk. And this is what this SQ gives us. So that's just great. We are super, super happy about that. And we are rolling it out, uh, telling uh, all of our big customers about that. That's just amazing. Um, the other thing that we are working on right now, which is again like uh, Huge, in my opinion, um, a lot of customers approached us and said, uh, hey, dear Kusto team, um, you know, we, we, we like to contextualize our data. You know, you get all of this beautiful log uh, data from all over the world. You get data from IoT devices. Uh, but, you know, we want to contextualize it because with IoT devices, if they send telemetry, sometimes you only get an ID a tag name and the value, okay, and that's it. And for some analytics, that's just not enough. So for some analytics, you want to have, for example, you want to have a lookup of that device. So what are the, what, are, what is the master data of that device? And that's usually a flat way of contextualizing data. So something that you can easily solve with a join, okay? That's simple. But you know, in, in some scenarios, and we get those scenarios more often, this kind of contextual data is organized as a graph. And then simple joins at some point don't work very well with relational databases. Um, so we uh, we added support for external graphs like Azure Digital Twins, uh, which acts as a graph. Um, but we're also now embedding uh, a new a new capabilities into the language itself. Uh, so we're working on uh, on an, on a syntax extensions which syntax extension which will allow us to do graph like uh, uh, queries in Kusto directly. So this is like um, a great thing and that we're pushing into this uh, direction, very, very important stuff. Um, we are continuously improving our ge geospatial capabilities. Uh, on geospatial, meanwhile, we have uh, more than, uh, four, or let's say 40 functions. Yeah. And, and our focus for geospatial is providing uh, good solutions for geospatial clustering. Uh, as mentioned, we get a lot of like telemetry data, and if you want to visualize this telemetry data that has some geospatial context, if you want to visualize it, you can't send to the poor UI, I don't know, one million data points, okay? Then the poor UI will just be dropped dead, um, won't be able to visualize anything. And with the, those geospatial clustering algorithms like uh, GeoHash, S2, and H3, we're able to do some clustering on this data and then just send fewer points uh, to visualize the data and also do some other nice things. So this is our focus here. Um, we are going to GA our own uh, dashboards. And that's one more important thing. So we have a, a, um, a nice visualization technology to do queries, to do ingestions, but also dashboards. Um, and we are going to GA that. Uh, we are going to add um, high granularity for uh, uh, customer managed keys. So that's a big thing uh, at Microsoft and um, having like a truly secure uh, environment. And so far, the level of granularity for uh, customer managed keys or bring your own key was on a cluster level, but uh, we are going to extend that now to the database level. So on Kusto, you can have up to, at the moment, 10,000 databases per cluster. So potentially every database will be able to have uh, their own. Um, their own key um, and like tons of other great things. You have a busy summer ahead of you. Yes, it's always yeah. busy, but you know what? <laughs> I just uh, love this product and it's uh, it's just fun to work with it, uh, fun to work with the product group with great people like VP and, and our developers. It's, it's such an amazing product uh, and you know, it, I always wanted to do something which people live, love to buy, okay? And for us, it's not really buying, they're kind of renting it from us <laughs> and by consuming that service. But you know, if you have such a service, which I don't know, eight uh, exabytes of data and all of this course uh, running on it and like people organically adapt it, then, then this is something that's uh, really, really inspiring and empowering and like just super nice. Yeah, it's amazing yeah. to see the uh, the customer scenarios, the uh, the things that they pull yeah. off with the technology. It's always impressive to see. So, 
it, it yeah, keeps us going. Yeah. I had a chance to work with this product uh, for the last six months, and I, I had no experience before that. And not only was it a great product, but uh, I was able to send questions to you two, and uh, you guys were really responsive. And I really appreciate that. Definitely. And I appreciate the time today. I learned a lot today. It's uh, <laughs> packed a lot into 30 minutes. So thank you so much. Thank you, uh, David. All my friends are in technology. So should I meet more people? Or?